to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. What is life? James chapter 4 and verse 14. What is life all about to you? Why are you living your life? What, what is it that you're chasing? What is it that you're trying to accomplish in this life? What's your goal? Ultimately, what's your goal in this life? James asks a great question in James chapter 4 and verse 14, and notice exactly what James says in this passage. James says, for what is your life? And then he answers it. It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Life, according to the teaching of James, is very brief, and it is the one shot we have to get right with God. It's so sad that many people are living life for other reasons and with other goals in mind. Some people would say, when asked the question, what is life? They would say, well, my life is just the result of a long period of evolutionary transcendence that began millions of years ago. We just came out of some cesspool, or we came from apes, or we evolved over millions of years. To many, life is nothing more than an evolutionary process and how sad that is to live your life in view of that. When asked the question, what is life? Some would say, my life is a pleasure ride. My motto is, live it up. I've got the motto that the one with the most toys in the end wins and thus I'm here to enjoy life. And this is the philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. When asked the question, what is life? Others would say, life's just a game. Like any other competition or sport, it's a game. It's a game of beating the odds and making the most of this life. This is the philosophy, again, the one with the most toys in the end, he wins. And thus, if you get to the end and you've got the most accomplishments, you've got the most stars on your, that you pinned on your shirt, then you win. That's how people view life at times. Ask the question, what is life? Some would say, life is really not worth living. It's dull. It's boring. It's full of hardship. These are usually people who are poor, who are grief stricken, and who have a lack of self-esteem. In fact, many of these people end up with either mental illness or suicide, depression, overcoming their life. It's a very dull and, and boring life, ridden with a lot of problems. But then ask the question, what is your life? There is one group of people who will say with a resounding voice, life is worth living and has real meaning and purpose to serve God. These are Christians. Christians understand the real meaning and the real purpose in life. You see, one of the devil's greatest ploys is uh, to cause us to think that the life is meaningless, that it's unimportant, that it's accidental. If Satan can cause us to think that life is nothing more than an accident, than some big bang, then all religion, all godliness seems to wane in view of God who can allow accidents to happen. In this lesson, we want to examine both sides of the pendulum when it comes to the question, what is your life? While doing this, we want you to, to really think about your own life right now. What view of life do you hold? What does your life mean to you? Is your life really worth living right now? Or are there changes you know need to be made so that your life can be a life worth living? First, let's examine what life is not. Life is not an adventure in humanism. The Humanist Manifesto says, We believe, however, that traditional, dogmatic, or authoritarian religions that place revelation, God, ritual, or creed above human needs and experiences do a disservice 
to the human species. Now that's humanism at its core. Get rid of dogmatic religion, take God and the Bible out, and let's just do what we feel like we need. Everything else is a disservice to humanity. Basically, this statement denies three fundamental truths of the Christian religion. It, it, it denies the fact that the Bible is inspired of God. We want to do away with revelation. Why? Because if there is revelation, there is authority from God, and we must submit to that. But friend, you can be sure the Bible is the Word of God. Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of God's Word is truth. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. John 16, verse 13, Jesus made this promise to His disciples. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth. And friend, we have that truth today. John 17, verse 17, Jesus said to the Father, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Holy men of God were guided along as they wrote down the words of the Bible. And so we don't buy in to the fact in the humanistic manifesto that says we need to do away with revelation. We believe and enjoy the best life. You've got to realize this book is from God. But it denies another fundamental truth. And that is the existence of God. Any religion that places God above humans does a disservice. Friend, I would say any belief system that places humans above God does a disservice to the existence of God and to the truths you find in the Bible. Psalm 14.1 says this, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The heart of the problem is humanist want the humanist manifesto and the humanist ideas to be their God. It's not that they don't believe in God in the sense that they don't want some higher standard, something to live for or look up to. They just don't like the way God says it must be done. But you can know there is a God. The Bible says in Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The fool stands up in the sky and says, wow. What a great making of evolution. What a great uh, feat of evolution. But how foolish it is to look at that design and think that there is not a designer. And then it denies another fundamental truth, and that is the need for doctrine and to do things the way God has said. There is doctrine. John 7, 17, Jesus said, If anyone wants to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. There are things that we must do and observe to be right with God. John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And so when we think about life and when we ask the question, What is life? Life is not an adventure in humanism. Listen very carefully. Life is not about me. And life is not about you. The humanists want you to think so. Life is about serving God and giving Him the glory and the honor in this life. When we think about humanism, another statement that is often made by humanists is found in the Humanist Manifesto and it says, we find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of a supernatural. It is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of the survival and fulfillment of the human race as non-theists. We begin with humans, not God, nature, not deity. What a messed up idea it is when we think about life and they say God is meaningless and irreverent. Don't start with God, start with self. Again, you can know there is a God. Romans 1 verse 20, by the things that are created, we can see the existence of God. Acts 14 verse 17 tells us that through the changing of the seasons and the things that occur, God witnesses to Himself. You see, Hebrews 3 and verse 4 says, Every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. You're driving down a road and you see a house. You don't say, wow, I bet it took millions of years for those shingles to get on that roof and the door to open like that. I just wonder how long it took. No, you see a house intricately put together, things working in harmony, and you think house, housemaker. 
When we look at the world, it's no different. This didn't happen by accident, by a big bang. Someone's rightly said that the chances of this earth being formed by an accident or a big bang is like saying a tornado went through a junkyard and in the end was a fully functioning 1957 Chevrolet car that run like a top. Now, would that ever happen? Of course not. The very fact that evolution created this world and that it works in harmony is foolish. To say God is meaningless and irrelevant is the height of blasphemy, and we need not look at nature and humans. We need to look to deity and God to see what's right in His sight. Humanists also say, promises of immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusory and harmful. No deity will save us. We must save ourselves. What in essence are they saying? Don't go around promising people that if you do right, you can go to heaven. And if you don't do right, you're going to be damned to hell. There's no God who's going to save you. It's all going to start right here. Friend, this teaches that salvation is a hoax, that heaven and hell are both an illusion, and the implications of this are, number one, God has lied to us, which Malachi 3 verse 6 says God does not change. Hebrews 6 verse 18, God does not lie. And if God lies, guess what? God is not God, and the Bible is not true. The truth cannot make you free because God lied. You cannot go to heaven if you live right because there is no God. And heaven and hell are just a myth or an illusion anyway. Just to state something isn't to prove it. Since we've shown there is proof for creation, and since we can know the Bible is the Word of God, I can know the promises of heaven and hell are not illusion and that we're not going to save ourselves only God can save us. Jeremiah said in the long ago, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not of man who walks to direct his own steps. If there's no hope of future salvation, of immortality of the soul, then what does life matter at all? If I'm just here for this life, I'm not going to have to give an account for what I do in the afterlife, then I can live any way I want. No wonder these people promote abortion, Murder, euthanasia, and ungodliness running rampant today. No wonder these are some of their main hobbies that they're writing because they want what man wants. But man's not in control. God is. We also need to realize that life is not an evolutionary accident. Now, we spoke about this just a little, but you can know that there is a God. You did not happen over millions of years by some process of things changing over time and adapting. You didn't happen over that period. You didn't come out of some cesspool of nothing. We didn't evolve from apes. We are the product of design. Notice again Psalm 19 verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, night unto night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Anywhere you go in the world and people speak and there's design and, and creation can be seen. That voice cries out, there is a God. Just like a watch demands a watchmaker, just like a house demands a housemaker, so we can know there is a God. We can know by the way things intricately work together. We can know by the harmony and creation. And we can know that God is behind that. Realize design demands a designer. God is the author of this world. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They are the work of His hand. God said, Let us... Make man in our image according to our likeness in Genesis 1.27. And thus in Genesis 2 verse 7, the Lord God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living being. It is not superstitious. It's not an illusion or a myth to say God created the world. There is scientific proof. There is proof inside the Bible. And friend, it's the best way you could ever live your life. Well, we can also know that life is not a, a pleasure-seeker's paradise. 
I am not here to eat, to drink, and to be merry. I'm not here to see how much I can fun I can have and how much of that I can have and to fulfill every lust and pleasure that I've got. You see, that's opposed to what God wants. Life's not about fulfilling all my pleasures. Life's not about me having all the toys. Ultimately, life is not about me. If we're going to live the best life and we're really going to answer the question, what is life? We've got to answer negatively first and say, this life is not about me. I need to put God at the center of my life. Notice the words of 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. The scripture says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. Notice, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Don't love the world. Why? Because all that's in the world is opposed to God and the lust and all that's in it is passing away. Let's say you go through life fulfilling every lust, fulfilling every pleasure, having all the fun you want, and you gain all the toys you want. In the end, you die, and you go to hell. Friend, what a waste your life would have been. If all you're seeking is your pleasure, here's another problem you'll have. You'll have to heighten the pleasure to make it worth it every time. One shot of heroin may do it the first time, or it may even do it the first few times, but it takes more the next time. And it takes more the next time. One pleasure may fulfill your lust at one point, but you are always going to have to heighten that pleasure to rise to the thrill that it once gave. Living a life of service to God doesn't require that. You can live a life of peace and happiness knowing that what you're doing is pleasing to God the Father. What else do we know about life? Life is very, very brief and fleeting. James asked the question in James 4, verse 14. What is your life? Here's the answer. It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. What's life like? Imagine you're standing at the gas pump and you're pumping gas into your car and you smell the gas fumes. You smell them for a split second, then they're gone. That's what life is like. It's like the dew on the ground. It's there, but when the sun comes out, immediately it vanishes away. If there's one thing the Bible teaches, it is that this life is very, very brief. We've got three score and 10, maybe four score years, 70, maybe 80 years, if we're lucky. I want you to notice what Job said. In Job chapter 14, verse one, the man of sorrow and suffering said, man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Life is not gonna last forever. There may be difficulty, but here's the good news. God is worth living life for and worth living life to the fullest. Think back to your own life. You can think about how fast things are going. You can probably remember the first day you went in kindergarten. You might can think of the, the first date you had. You might can remember high school graduation. Maybe you remember the first job or marriage or when your first child was born and, and you look back on that and it seems like yesterday, but years have likely passed since those events. Here's the point. Since life is very brief, make it your life's goal to serve God and to obey Him to the utmost. Do your best to live your life in such a way that God will receive the glory and the honor. And here's what we mean by that. You need to give your life as a living sacrifice. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I need to realize that I've got to take up my cross daily and live for Jesus. That I've got to, if I really love Him, I've got to keep His commandments. Luke 9, 23, John chapter 14 and verse 15. And so realize life is short, and I've got to live life in such a way that I obey God and keep His commandments. But now listen carefully. Realize also, as we ask the question, what is life? This life is your one chance to get to heaven. This is all you've got. 
There isn't going to be another life. You're not going to be reincarnated and get another chance. Nobody's going to buy you out of purgatory. Nobody can be baptized by proxy for you. This is your one and only shot. You only get one, and this is it. I want you to think about the rhetorical questions of Jesus, and I want you to think real seriously about what he asked. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37, Jesus says, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what? Shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What's going to profit you if you're the richest person in the world and you die and go to hell? What's it going to profit you if you get to the gates of heaven, you've not lived like you ought to, and God says, no way. And you say, well, I've got all this stuff. I'll give it to you even though I didn't live right. It's not going to profit a man if he doesn't live right. My duty and my privilege in this life is to live in such a way that I can one day be with God in heaven. I'm reminded of a man who did not do that. Two men, actually. In Mark chapter 10, you've got the example of the rich young ruler. A man comes to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, in essence, keep the commandments. Uh, do not murder, do not steal, do not lie, do not commit adultery. He says, Lord, I've done all those from my youth. And then he looks at the man and says, one thing you lack. Uh-oh. Sell what you have. Give to the poor and come follow me. Here's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Mark 10, I believe it's verse 17. Jesus said, or the Bible says, that man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. How sad it was. That man missed out on the opportunity to get his life right. Think about another man. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. The rich fool he had a great year and his business or his crops did well. And he said, so you've got many goods laid up for many years. Just take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. In essence, was his philosophy. But you know what God said to that man? You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. And then whose things will those be which you have acquired? And then he said this, so is he who is rich, but not toward or in godliness. There's the point. Riches and things of this world won't save us godliness and doing right will. And so we ask you today, what is your life being lived for? What, why are you living life? What's life all about to you? Are you chasing after the almighty dollar? Or are you trying to fulfill every, every pleasure and lust? Or are you trying to see if you can gain the most toys in the end? Friend, what a futile and vain effort that will be. You'll never reach a point where you can really be satisfied. But you can reach a point like the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 who said, I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. And in whatever state I'm in, rich or poor, I can be content. How is that? Paul learned what life is really about. Are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? You really want to answer the question, what is life? Life is your one opportunity to obey the gospel and live for Jesus Christ. Someone says, well, what must I do to become a Christian? That's a wonderful question. The same question was asked in Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, when he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here's the answer from Scripture. You first must hear the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. By hearing the Word of God, we mean that you accept this book as the sole authority in all matters. This is the only guide. This is the only book we follow. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I realize Jesus has all authority. I realize that I must not go beyond what's written in the book, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. I realize that I must not add to nor take away from the pages of the book. I simply need to do what God says. John chapter 2 and verse 5. Having heard the word of God, you then must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. In Acts chapter 8, as Philip is teaching the Ethiopian eunuch, they're traveling down the road and he comes to a certain water and evidently he's talking about baptism. He says, here's water. What did it hinder me from being baptized? Do you remember the answer? If you believe with all your heart, 
you may. Acts 8, verses 33 through 39. Have you believed with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God? You've got to believe, but belief alone won't save. James 2, verse 24 says that a man is not justified by faith or belief alone. I also must be willing to repent of the wrong that I've done. Repentance is necessary, essential to salvation. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and in Luke 13, 5, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Repentance means that I'm willing to change my will and to change my way. I change my way of thinking and then I change my way of acting. I stop thinking selfishly, sinfully, and foolishly and I start thinking the way God has told us in the Bible and then I start doing what God wants me to do. Then you must make that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10 says, with the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation. Having made that good confession, you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. There are a multitude of people, religious leaders and false teachers, who will say that baptism is not essential to salvation. Friend, that is just not true. That is in direct opposition to what the Scriptures teach. Listen to these passages. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Ananias said in Acts 22, 16, that baptism was to wash away sins. Jesus said it is baptism and belief that saves, Mark 16, 16. Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, that you can't get in the kingdom without being born of water. And Peter said, baptism does now also save us. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And so what is life? It's your one chance to get right with God. I ask you today, are you right with God? Or are you sure that you're right with God? Have you obeyed the gospel? This is your one chance in life to do that. And friend, out of love for your soul, we're begging you, get right with God before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.